court. Um, so yes, yeah, so just uh, to let everybody know, we are recording um, these uh, closing remarks, just so you know. Um, so I was in the middle of my thank you. So thank you to, um, uh, to uh, Dr. Jarpa Dewani again and the Institute for African Women in Law. Many thanks as well to our keynote and closing remark speakers, Judge and Kem Uzuako and Professor Penelope Andrews, not only for their talks, but also for attending and supporting the conference throughout the week. Um, and I would personally like to thank uh, Professor Gebra Muse for leading this collaborative initiative. Um, and finally, huge thank yous to all of you, to the participants, to the presenters and session attendees who've truly made this an engaging and thought-provoking week. It has been an expansive conference with conversations about the current pandemic, structures of property holding, the importance of women in pre and post-colonial emancipation, the role of the development worker and more. Um, throughout the week has been rich in critical engagement with the foundational question, in my mind, one of the most important questions for sustainable growth worldwide, that is of how to build a development agenda that serves the continent and represents African values. And while we miss seeing people in person, the online format has given us the opportunity to have a truly global conversation about these issues. Consistently throughout the week, we've seen participants making connections and asking for the dialogue to continue. And what we're hoping is that this can become a network for shared resources and ongoing discussion. And so to that end, we wanted to alert people to the blog page on the Conference Network website, We'll provide additional details in a post-conference email, but for now, I just wanted to bring your attention that this is one of uh, the places, an option for sharing and receiving feedback on works in progress. Um, and with that said, I would now like to introduce Delapo Makende, who is our moderator and who will introduce our concluding speaker. Delapo is a PhD student and Lew Scholar at the University of British Columbia, having completed her Master's of Law at UBC and a Bachelor's of Law from the University of Lagos. Delapo has served as a researcher for the Cullen Commissionary Commission of Inquiry into Money Laundering, and as a UBC Sustainability Scholar, helping the City of Vancouver lay the groundwork for its first anti-Black racism strategy. Delapo has written on gender diversity on corporate boards, mineral extraction, and environmental degradation, and the constructed conception of corruption. It has been an honor and a pleasure to work with you this past year. Thank you, Delapo. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Toby. Um, and thank you very much, um, Sarah. Um, so it's my privilege to introduce our um, speaker for today, um, Professor Penelope Andrews, who will be delivering the closing remarks um, to conclude this wonderful conference. And just to give you um, a bit of uh, an idea of, um, of, of Professor, Professor Andrews' profile, uh, she's a professor of law at the New York Law School, where she teaches comparative and international law courses. She also serves as a as co-director of the New York Law School's Racial Justice Project, focusing on international and South African issues, and was the immediate past president of the Law and Society Association. Uh, Professor Andrews began her teaching career at La Trobe University in Australia, where she taught for eight years before moving to the City University of New York Law School, where she taught public interna international law, gender and law, race and law, comparative law, and taught for 15 years. She has also held visiting appointments at law schools across the US and internationally. From 2016 to 2018, Professor Andrews also served as the first black dean at the University of Cape Town Faculty of Law. And from 2012 to 2015, she served as the first female dean of Albany Law School. Professor Andrews is active in international collaborative research and mentoring networks, and is committed to ensuring the relevance of law and society scholarship to global academic communities. She's an editor of the International Journal of Law in Context, the Human Rights and Global Economy E-Journal, and the African Law E-Journal. Professor Andrews focused on the judiciary in South Africa, seeks to bridge the divide between theory and practice. She's a trainer for the Judicial Institute of, for Africa, focusing on opinion writing and communication skills for judges. She has also act, served as an acting judge of the North Guateng High Court in Pretoria, for the 2018 third term and as an arbitrator in hearings on racial discrimination in South Africa. So please join me today in welcoming Professor Andrews um, as she delivers the closing remarks for this conference. Uh, Professor Andrews, the floor is yours. 
Thank you, Delopa. Thank you for your very gracious introduction. And I also, before I start, <coughs> let me thank uh, Toby and Sarah and everybody else involved in organizing this conference. It's been very inspiring for me uh, since Monday to sit in um, on many of the sessions. And uh, the input was has been so thoughtful and engaging and creative. I mean, who would have thought that we would have uh, listened to a presentation on uh, space and Africa, space law and Africa. These sorts of questions I think are so important, but uh, uh, it has brought home to me just the range of questions that you've addressed uh, from technology to gender equality, uh, corporate accountability and so on. So thank you. You know, when you fly uh, on American Airlines, one of the things that the pilot says at the end of the flight is, thank you for flying with American. We know you have many choices and we've glad, we're glad you've chosen us. So to those of you who are attending, I know that you have many things to do. So I'm really grateful that you're listening to my remarks today. Um, so uh, what I'm, I'm, I'm doing is, is it, I'm sort of building on some of the issues that's been raised at the conference. Um, and, you know, some of the uh, thoughtful remarks that uh, Judge Izuako raised in her opening address uh, to the conference. Um, and that is sort of thinking about uh, decolonization as world making. And I'm building here particularly on the work of Adam Getachew, uh, who's based in Washington, has just produced a book um, world, the title is World Making After Empire, uh, in which he revisits some of the early days, the early anti-colonial movement. Um, I'm also, of course, as this has been mentioned at many of the panels, Third World Approaches to International Law 12, I've been sort of uh, um, involved with and influenced by 12 for a long time. Um, and then also the, um, the work of uh, Achille Mbembe, who is a scholar based in Johannesburg, who's also exploring these questions, uh, but from the perspective of centering Ubuntu. Uh, so the title of my paper, uh, the, sort of my remarks I've entitled uh, uh, Decolonization as World Making. And the central questions, uh, let me just go to the screen here because I'm sharing the screen. Um, the central question that I um, want to address uh, uh, in, in, in my comments are, the first is could the current moment that we're in with Black Lives Matter, decolonizing law, roads must fall and so on, constitute a global anti-colonial and anti-racist moment? And if so, what are the major markers of such a movement? What, are, what theoretical and practical lessons might the contemporary decolonial movement learn from early 20th century anti-colonial movements, particularly the period leading to the end of the Second World War and the first wave of decolonization. Uh, another question that I will, uh, that I want to raise in my comments is, does the contemporary moment of racial reckoning and economic reckoning, uh, uh, particularly unleashed by the pandemic, create the discursive space for a reimagined anti-racist anti-colonial global community? And then what spaces in international law and international legal institutions either facilitate or limit the possibilities for world making um, as conceived by the earlier anti-colonial and anti-racist pioneers like W.E. Du Bois, Marcus Garvey, Edgar Wilmot Blyden, James Padmore and others. So I'm going to do two things in the time sort of allocated uh, to me. Uh, first, I'll, I'll sort of uh, set the context for the discussion, uh, including a discussion about some of the leading figures in the anti-colonial pan-Africanist movement and their influence on the global struggle against colonialism. And then I will raise some uh, questions about the contemporary moment about uh, of ongoing dialogues around decolonization and how we might consider Agenda 2063 as part of that reconfigured and reimagined global space. So the context, um, 
I suppose one could characterize this moment uh, um, in history as a search for accountability. And it's very pronounced in the most popular movements that we've seen. Um, I would say starting uh, with the Arab Spring, but even beyond that, looking at movements like Me Too, uh, Black Lives Matter, Roads Must Fall, and others. And what this, this moment of accountability is linked to, uh, it relates to historical wrongs which continue to impact contemporary life. The impact of slavery, for example, in the United States, the continuing impact of apartheid and colonialism in South Africa, uh, the legacy of colonialism in many parts of the world, discrimination against racial minorities in the global North and so on. So this is sort of some looking at the historical context and this moment of reckoning and what it means. Um, early this semester in April, I participated uh, in the annual British Sociolegal Conference. And I was talking about Paul Robeson and the anti-colonial and anti-apartheid struggle. And I was, during my talk in preparing preparation for the talk, I was reminded of this range of anti-colonial scholars and activists that had dominated much of the uh, uh, organizing, the political and legal organizing, as I said, up until the moment of uh, uh, colonialism. And I just wanna play a clip for you. Many of you may know of Paul Robeson, but Paul Robeson was, you know, one of those early 20th century internationalist humanitarians who connected at a deep and profound level uh, with the struggles of Black Americans, but he also was very committed to the struggles against fascism, colonialism, racism, imperial, imperialism, and apartheid. And he was part of an early cohort of African American activists, theorists, artists, um, that had been preceded, as I said earlier, a, a, a generation before by W.E. Du Bois, Marcus Garvey, and so on. And what they did was connect the struggle of, uh, of racism in the United States to the anti-colonial struggle. Now, what, I, what I'm trying to do in this paper that I'm working on is really trying to connect this moment of Black Lives Matter and the sort of resonance of Black Lives Matter globally to raise this question whether what was possible in those early um, uh, pan-Africanist anti-colonial movements and people like Paul Robeson and whether that's possible today and I'll have you know at the end I'll sort of raise some uh, uh, some suggestions as to why I think uh, that it's possible it's not the same so now again this is dated I want to play for you a clip of Paul Robeson at a studio in, in Australia in Sydney Australia I think this was in the 1940s or 50s, I'm not sure. Um, so let me just uh, play this. Um, hang on. Come on. Sorry. Uh, how is Can it everybody hear? That the American Negro, who for so long has been a second class citizen in yeah, the United still States. Still is, I'm sorry. Uh, well, how, long, how is it that he's contributed so much to American <coughs> culture? Well, it's music. Dance, you know. everything you can think well, of. Well, I have to be very modest about that. I would say <laughs> certainly as we look at the African peoples in Nigeria, for example, I just got a wonderful invitation to go to Nigeria to be present at the installation at the, uh, at the uh, Governor General, Azikwe, an old friend, mm. who will now, and, I, and I had to cable him, I'm in Australia. I certainly would like to be with you, uh, but I'm out here with some good folks, but I'll... Sorry, I'm starting, sorry. I just got a wonderful invitation to go to Nigeria to be present. Mm. Who will now, and, I, and I had to cable him. I'm in Australia. I certainly would like to be with you. But I'm out here with some good folks, but I'll get to Nigeria later. Mr. Robson, so, do you feel yeah. that Africa is to some extent an affinity for it, a home, or do you still feel America is essentially your home? How do you feel? In, with well, let me come here. Yeah, I'll come to that in just a second. But to come back to it, so I would say the Africans and the American Negroes have turned out to be an extraordinarily gifted people. The great tragedy is that by not making us full-class citizens as yet in America, they may be losing, I don't know how much yet. And to come back, uh, 
I would say that unquestionably, I am an American, born there, uh, my father slave there, upon the backs of my people was developed the primary wealth of America, mm. the primary wealth. You have to have accumulated wealth to start, you know, to build. Mm. You did it another way here in Australia, you, you know, you had to build your accumulated wealth. Mm. You just came and took it, you know what I mean? And that's what they did in most of the countries. It's what you West, it's what you Europeans did, you just took it. We got to catch up with you a little bit. <laughs> and so in America, so there's a lot of America that belongs to me yet, you understand? Mm. But just like a Scottish American is proud of being from Scotland, mm. I'm proud for being African. Now in our school books, they tried to tell me that all Africans were savages till I got to London and found most of the Africans I knew in, were going to Oxford and Cambridge and doing very well <laughs> and, uh, and learned their culture. Uh, and even once had, well, somebody had the temerity after one had, had t conquered the Chinese people and imposed upon them the opium trade and everything else to suggest that they were a backward people, just the people who had been civilized so long over the rest of you folks didn't make any sense at all. So somewhere uh, it was wonderful to find about the colored peoples of the world that they were very advanced. So I would say today that I'm an American who is infinitely prouder to be of African descent, no question about it. No question about it. I'm an Afro-American, and I don't use the word American ever loosely again. Now, this was, the feeling, right. this was the feeling uh, That's right. that, that when you, you were in London about 19, say, 37, 38, you really had the world at your feet then. I mean, you were a tremendous success. You were recognized all over the world. And yet you went back to America. Was this, right. this was the feeling that took you back. I it? felt I had to go back. Okay, so I just want to sort of play this sort of clip. Of the, the very, very strong identity. Of course, it's dated. The language is a little quaint. But the very strong identity uh, of um, Black Americans with the struggle of African, African peoples. So the... Um, as I said, these, they were very committed. And the first African country to receive independence, Ghana, in 1957, um, at the inauguration of President Nkrumah, guests at the independence celebrations included Dr. Martin Luther King, Mrs. Coretta Scott King, A. Philip Randolph, Ralph Bunch, Congressman Adam Clayton Powell. Very strong connection. And that nearly 40 years later, the scene was played out again after South Africa's first democratic elections and the inauguration of President Mandela. And in between the inauguration of Presidents Kaunda, Kenyatta, and so on, very, very strong connections. And in fact, we also saw um, uh, the movement of African Americans to the continent, communities of Black Americans in Ghana, in Kenya, and so on after independence. And even in South Africa, we saw some of that. And the, the, the Pan-Africanist movement, um, much has been written about the Pan-Africanist movement, but it was a very, very important movement at which the thinkers, the great thinkers of Pan-Africanism really pushed forward an agenda in which you could see the goal of colon uh, uh, the goal of the end of colonization and what actually happened. So this, and it was in 1900, in fact, at the first Pan-Africanist Congress that W.E. Du Bois famously announced that the problem of the 20th century would be the problem of the color line. And in fact, now into the 21st century, we could still look at uh, W.E. Du Bois statement as the problem uh, of the color line. So this, this sort of this, this, this movement has been, has been very, very important. Um, I just want to uh, um, uh, give you an, uh, an example. The Pan-Africanist Congress, the first one in 1900, uh, was held, if you can see that, in, um, um, in, in London. All right, and this is, as I said, where W.E. Du Bois uh, spoke about uh, the problem of the color line. And this was sort of what the Pan-Africanist Congress was about. It was really about the fact that Black people from the continent, as well as from the United States, Canada, Australia, and so on, had fought with the European allies, in, and particularly in the Second World War, but also in the, in the First World War. And the idea was that to link the struggle against uh, Jim Crow and racism in the United States to the movement towards uh, decoloni uh, decolonization. So, um, when, when uh, Amy Césaire's uh, essay, Discourse 
on colonialism was published in 1950 in the wake of the aftermath of the Second World War and in the shadow of the collapse of the various empires, the colonial empires at the end of the Second World War obviously could not be sustained. And the racist project, the racist project of white supremacy and black racial inferiority was now largely in ruins, particularly since fascism, a particular form of racism had been fought against by the allies. And so the project, the theoretical project of the philosophical project of racism essentially had to end with the Second World War. And you see the beginnings of the anti-colonial uh, movement. And we saw, you know, the beginning with uh, uh, the Mau Mau uprising, et cetera, across Africa, the movement for decolonization was very strong at the end of, of, of the, uh, the Second World War. Uh, Robin Kelly, who is a decolonial scholar in the United States, um, he spoke about um, in his work, it refers to the 1945 Pan-Africanist Congress, and many people have referred to 1945 as one of the seminal ones. It was held in Manchester in England, and it was an important moment at which the future and freedom of Africa was on the cards, on the table, and very, very real. And the French were also encountering a resistance in the French colonies in Morocco, in Cameroon, Madagascar, Tunisia, and so on. And Robin Kelly writes that revolt was in the air, as he observes, and I'm quoting from Robin Kelly, India, the Philippines, Guyana, Egypt, Guatemala, South Africa, Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia, Harlem, you name it, revolt. Malcolm X once described this extraordinary moment, this long decade from the end of the Second World War to the late 1950s as a tidal wave of color. And I end, my, uh, end the quote here. So as I said, these locations of struggle of Anti-racism in the United States and the anti-colonial project in the Africa in Africa is essentially what I'm looking at in the contemporary moment. What did that mean? What was achieved? There's philosophical underpinnings and so on. How do they relate today? An important point that I also make in my paper, as Decolonize, decolonization was unfolding across Africa, starting with Ghana and then um, uh, countries that followed. In the United States, the civil rights struggle was also gaining traction. But the way that Africa's independence affected the civil rights struggle has been very neatly analyzed by Mary Dudziak in her work her work on the Cold War. And what actually happened is, is, is that as African diplomats and African uh, politicians and other leading Africans came to the United States as members of newly independent African states, they confronted racism in New York and Los Angeles and Chicago. And for the foreign policy establishment in the United States, particularly since the United States was trying to position itself as the leader of the free world, this display of racism was deeply, deeply embarrassing. And so the consensus around anti-racism emerged within the foreign policy establishment. And Mary Dudziak neatly, neatly sort of uh, uh, writes about how the foreign policy establishment pushed local people, because there was also you know, Martin Luther King and people were pushing for anti-racism within the United States. But it was African leaders who themselves refused to be subjected to American racism that in some ways also influenced the anti-racist struggle. Um, some of you may be familiar with uh, Isabel Wilkerson's latest book in, uh, called Cast in which is she demonstrates the, so how the similarities and the convergences of the use of race to divide, oppress, and subjugate individuals beyond the United States provides a salient prism through which to analyze the long history of uh, racism in the United States. And so although racism is not a uniquely American feature, 
Isabel Wilkinson argues in cast that it shares similarities with societies like Nazi Germany, apartheid South Africa, colonial India, colonial Australia, and others. So that's sort of the historical part and the historical context, but for reasons of time, I'm not going to be able to explore much of that. Now I'd like to focus just on today on Black Lives Matter and the sort of decolonial movement, not the anti-colonial movement, the decolonial or post-colonial movement. And before I do that, I also want to refer to some movements between the end of colonization and today, uh, uh, Black Lives Matter and Roads Must Fall and so on, various attempts by um, various African leaders to some extent uh, sort of uh, recharge the uh, African re Renaissance and the Pan-Africanist movement. We know that Muammar Gaddafi was very, very uh, committed to this project, President Wade from Senegal, most notably my country, South Africa, President Thabo and Becky was very committed to the African Renaissance and he made this famous speech, I am an African. Of course, it feel, falls flat when you look at the history of xenophobia and Afrophobia in South Africa, which raises all kinds of questions about the African Renaissance, but that's just a, an aside. So let me just go to Black Lives Matter. And the reason why I have uh, uh, um, sought to explore this question is because I observed during the pandemic in New York and particularly after the killing of George Floyd and the resurfacing of Black Lives Matter, which had started in 2013, the resurfacing, I observed how it resonated internationally. It resonated in places like Canada, like Australia, France, the UK and so on, and even in South Africa. And I recall when I was Dean at the University of Cape Town, with the uh, hashtag roads must fall and hashtag fees must fall. One of the things that I found quite interesting was the use by South African students of terminology that uh, 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 protesters in, South in the United States had used Black Lives Matter, Occupy Wall Street and so on. So there was a real sort of connection. This was before this second iteration of Black Lives Matter. Um, so the symbols are, are, are the same in many ways. The narrative appears to be the same, the slogans, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so what is, how does one connect? Can you sort of weave a thread from hashtag roads must fall and other decolonial movements to hashtag black lives matter? Now, one way to uh, 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 um, thread the needle as it were, was looking at hashtag roads must fall and some of the developments in its wake. So for example, after roads must fall, certain um, universities in the United Kingdom followed suit and particularly the statue of Cecil John Rhodes at Oriel College in Oxford was under uh, scrutiny. We just know that, you know, it's not that that statue is not going anywhere, but there was a big push at this point. Similarly, in the United States, there's been an interesting um, sort of decolonial, post-colonial movement at univer on university campuses. So some of you may be aware at Yale University, for example, there was a student resident named after a slavery adv advocate and a Confederate politician. The university decided to remove the name of this person and replace it with the name of a female graduate of Yale who also happened to be a computer engineer. Similarly, at Harvard, uh, at Harvard Law School, after a campaign under the name hashtag Royale must fall, Harvard Law School replaced its coat of arms uh, um, with the family name because of its historical connections to uh, slavery. So there's been a, uh, a significant movement on university campuses. We've seen that universities, for example, like American University, Princeton, the University of Virginia, et cetera, et cetera, those who have been involved uh, with the slave trade, there's a lot of analysis and question going on. Georgetown University has done incredible things to try and redress 
its role in the sale of slaves uh, um, with the university. And just recently, just in the past month, just incredible, the University of Illinois School of Law in Chicago decided to remove the name of the former Chief Justice John Marshall from the school because of his uh, slave ownership and because of his racist beliefs. So there's this sort of moment of decolonization going on in the United States too, around uh, these symbols of, uh, of colonialism. What I'd like to do is sort of think about the anti-colonial movement and the moment and this post-colonial movement. Because the anti-colonial movement obviously operated in a historical context in which the goals of the end of colonialism was clear. There was a shared sense of the goals and visions. What does it mean for the post-colonial movement? How do we think about a global pan-Africanist movement, a sort of renaissance of Africa in the context of a continent where there's been political independence at least, economic independence is questionable, and Twell obviously has interrogated that. So what do we do? Are there shared goals? The legal infrastructure of colonialism has been dismantled. What about the economic infrastructure and how do we sort of think about that as part of a post-colonial global move? The anti-colonial movement was also fueled by a deep sense of optimism and hope. Is this current moment fueled by optimism and hope or is it one of uh, despair? Um, if, for example, South Africa. South Africa was the last country on the continent to achieve uh, independence, to achieve political independence. South Africa's constitution and the Bill of Rights is seen as the most important human rights document of the late 20th century. The document embodies, as Makao Matua has said, the sort of hopes of human rights activists from around the world. And I know when I was in South Africa during the lead up to the elections and the drafting of the constitution, it felt like a global human rights workshop. Everybody from everywhere wanted to have input into the constitution. And South Africa's Bill of Rights in many ways reflects Canadian jurisprudence, Canadian constitutional provisions, Indian provisions, uh, Australian, Zimbabwean, Kenyan, it, it's, it's a, an interesting mixture of um, rights and constitutionalism taken from various places. Today, however, that constitution and even Nelson Mandela's legacy is being questioned. Uh, um, and, and part of it is, is a new generation of scholars who believe that the post-colonial moment in South Africa didn't promise and the compromises were too large to lead to um, a real uh, a, a transformation. So how do we think about these two movements? And then the second question that I want to raise is this idea about the anti-colonial versus the post-colonial movement. The second is, is the organs of international governance and international structures. The United Nations has increasingly come under critiques from both the left and the right. I mean, there's a lot of American critique about the United Nations, mostly they're conservatives um, who don't believe in the vision any longer of the United Nations. But from the left, there's a critique about the usefulness of the United Nations and its ability, not just to make a difference in the world, but also whether the structures are no longer fit for purpose in 2021. So there's a, there's a, the question we have to address is, do international institutions either further or curb the possibilities of transformation and sort of a global uh, 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 movement against uh, uh, decolonization? Um, then the third question I think that I, uh, I'd like to sort of just pose for you and maybe we can pursue this in, uh, in uh, the conversations in the Q&A, is how do we think about a pan-Africanism? How do we think about decolonization, um, a global movement when the unique situations of discrete groups makes that difficult, it makes it challenging. So for example, 
When we think about decolonization, how do we think about the treatment of Muslims by Hindu nationalists in India? How do we think about the Palestinian Israeli question? How do we think about the situation of Afro-Brazilians Afro and the discrimination in Brazil? Um, how do we think about the Uyghur population in China and what's been unleashed uh, there and so on? So how do we think about sort of decolonization when the sites of struggle create great challenges because of the particular situations? And I know that people, for example, um, with, the, with apartheid, people have analogized apartheid to many, many situations. Sometimes that may be useful, but I'm not so sure if it's always useful. So I think we need to think about that. And then finally, the final question, if Black Lives Matter is resonating globally, aren't we in danger of, cent of centering the American experience? Does the American experience of racial discrimination become the hege hegemonic one when in actual fact, the American experience of racial discrimination, it shares much with other post-colonial societies, but there's also huge differences. And if you just uh, uh, sort of, if you uh, engage and connect uh, the American struggle and analogize it too strongly, I think you lose a lot. So those are the questions that I wanna think about. And then finally, I'm going to show you some slides from the Pan-Africanist Congress. The move, the, there were about seven Pan-Africanist Congress starting in 1900. I've shown you the 1901. You'll see something, uh, you know, in the, but let's just look at the photos. And then I want to talk about what I think about as a Pan-Africanist movement, a decolonizing movement today. So that's the uh, uh, Pan-Africanist Congress in Paris in 1927. Sorry, these are archival pictures that are not so. So this is the, sorry, this is the 1910 uh, Pan-Africanist Congress in Paris. You'll see W.E. Du Bois there in the front and there are members from Guadeloupe, from Liberia, etc., etc. This is the Pan-Africanist Congress in 1917 in New York. Now look, if you look at this, you have lots of women at the conference and so on. All right, and then the pan after the very famous 1945 Manchester conference, you'll see there the lone female delegate, of course, at this conference, George Padmore, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then this is a picture of the leaders of the Pan-Africanist movement. You know, you'll see the um, Haile Selassie, uh, you'll see Kenneth Kawunda, Julius Nyerere, and so on, Milton Oboti from, uh, um, from Uganda. And so these were the sort of leaders of the, the, the Pan-Africanist and the anti-colonial uh, movement. And then, you know, just Paul Robeson again, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, what he has, his, his commitment to the Pan-Africanist Pan movement and the movement against colonialism. So what I've suggested is, is one thing about the Pan-Africanist movement and the decolonizing movement is that the gendered part of it is, is very important. It's central, but, you know, when one thinks about the major leaders of the Pan-Africanist movement, it's almost overwhelmingly male. And it's not that women didn't contribute, but they, they, clearly their role was not uh, uh, um, uh, noted in the way that um, uh, uh, the, those of the males, the leading males, as I said, W.E. Du Bois, Franz Fanon, you know, Steve Biko, all of them. So when we're thinking about a global decolonizing movement, I just want to mention some names of some women, I think, who could be central to our thinking about it. I'm thinking here of Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, who was the first uh, uh, female president of Nigeria. She won the Nobel Peace Prize and so on. Fatu Bensouda, who was the uh, chief prosecutor of the International Criminal Court. I'm thinking of Wangara Maathai, the environmental activist who also won the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, Angelique Kijo, the musician. There were many, many artists involved in the anti-colonial movement. Chimamanda and Gozi Adichie, you know, the writers that were there. Um, Cesaria uh, Evora, uh, the Cape Verdean musician and so on. Navi Perlay, 
Dame Linda Dobbs in the UK. So there's a whole range of people that I hope that when we think about uh, the anti-colonial or the post-colonial movement, that certainly the women who are very much part of it is now recognized and form part of the core. So I'll end there. Um, thank you so much. I uh, Let me stop share here. Thank you. Sorry, thank Johnson you. Sirley, did I not say Liger Liberia? I'm so sorry. <laughs> thank you, Veronica. Thank you very much, Professor Andrews, uh, for this very enlightening talk about um, the Pan-Africanist movement and decolonization across the world. I think we've all um, taken quite a number of points from that. And I imagine that the audience is excited to ask a number of questions. So if you have questions, you can either, you know, place it in the group chat or you can just, you know, raise your hands and um, the floor will be yours. Okay, so Professor Lazarus has a question, so over to you. Hi, Penelope, thank you so Hi. much for a great talk. It's, it's lovely to see you. Um, I wondered whether I could throw a few things into the mix. I wondered what your view was on the new unity movement. Um, because um, some of the very strong streams of the sort of economic theories um, were kind of being theorized in the new unity movement a very long time ago. I, and and I, I noticed you focus on the Pan-African movement quite significantly, but I wondered about that, I just, uh, I mean, maybe it's because we have someone in our family who was a great leader in that movement, but, um, and that also leads me to a, a more methodological question around language. So um, this particular character in our family, Hazard Jaffe, went from, went into the kind of Spanish speaking, Portuguese speaking parts, sorry, the Portuguese speaking parts of Africa and theories around this and then ended up writing in Italian. I wondered to what extent that the restrict that the focus on English language theories around historically maybe sort of giving a particular view of how the conceptual foundations of of Black Lives Matter. I mean, I see the streams working quite interestingly in terms of particularly anti-capitalism and its close relationship to Black Lives Matter in this context. Um, so I'm just sort of throwing okay. that out there. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that question, Leora. Let me just say the new unity movement was very uh, prominent in South Africa during the apartheid and um, uh, colonial days, but it was mostly confined to the Western Cape. Yeah. And it was mostly confined. I'm in South Africa, I'm classified as colored. Yeah. And the new unity movement was largely identified with the colored population, in the Cape, although you know, members came from all racial groups. The new unity movement philosophically, one could argue, was a Marxist movement. A lot of the, the focus was on class. And even though race was obviously the key issue in South Africa, I think that new unity movement was very, very, from my perspective, should have had more influence, but didn't. Um, and the new unity movement ideas about a more egalitarian South Africa, I think has been lost. That a lot of it has been placed by a politics of race, which isn't necessarily transformative. Um, and I think part of the problem has been, you know, we can talk about, you know, South Africa and other countries as well, about the system of government and capitalism um, in the wake of you know, uh, the post-1989 era. I think people forget how the end of the Cold War and particularly 1989 and the end of the um, uh, sort of so uh, socialist uh, uh, economies, really the sort of idea that the West had won and capitalism was here to stay, the language of rights quickly replaced the language of redistribution. And the new, new unity movement was about the language of redistribution. And in fact, the ANC, the governing party, had always been about redistribution. But the post-1989 world and the Washington consensus was about rights and not redistribution, which meant that most places could were cabined in. And so radical politics have been usurped by a very uh, identitarian and racial politics which has its limitations. So yeah, the new unity movement, I don't think the new unity movement exists anymore, but as a child, certainly, and it was banned. At, at some point, the South African government banned it. So, you know, when I was growing up, the ANC had been banned, the PAC, the new unity movement and so on. So I think, and then the question of language, you know, I have not, I don't have much expertise and I haven't given much consideration to questions of language. Um, and I, I wish I knew, you know, I understood more. So as a lay person for me, 
uh, of obviously the South African constitution provides that all 11, the, there are 11 official languages, which should be treated equally, but that's not the case. English is still the hegemonic language. It's a language of commerce and so on, and English still dominates. But all other languages, Afrikaans, Zulu, Shangan, and so on. Um, and I think there are many reasons for it. One of it is, you know, resources. But I think it's a very, very fraught and complicated question. But, they, you know, language, uh, language discrimination and language subjugation is alive and well in, in South Africa and I imagine in other parts of the world, but it's not something that I have much expertise on. So Leora, I, I'm sorry, I'm giving you a very undeveloped answer on that so, one. Well, to, to, to follow up on that, and, and just to say, I'm, I'm also thinking about languages in the colonial context of the whole of Africa. So not just English, but also thinking about French and Portuguese and what theory theorization was going on in terms of the manifestation of what's happening in France now or in, in other parts of the country. I think that's, I mean, that's an interesting crossover that I wonder whether we're all, whether, whether there's a level at which languages are operating in different streams and how we can straddle that. Well. Yeah, yeah, thank you. I see Andrew's got his hand up. Yes, Andrew, you can ask your question as well. Thanks, Professor Andrews. Wow, that was very interesting. Um, took us to a lot of places that I didn't see, I didn't envision we were going and it was just a quite a ride and I really enjoyed that. Thank you. Um, uh, I, I know you you dropped in at the last panel, um, the tech one, and, and I know briefly we were talking about satellites in Africa and um, I had mentioned Gaddafi and, and uh, Pan-Africanism in Libya and you touched on that. So I, I kind of want to bring that back in quickly, but to, to set the context there, I noticed the 1910 and the 19. 19 uh, Pan-Africa meetings, uh, interestingly, were held in, uh, you know, Western countries. And so uh, I, I'm ignorant on this, but I'm wondering if there were subsequent Pan-African meetings that occurred in Africa, or whether uh, the structure of Pan-Africanism is actually sort of a form of Western uh, suppression or oppression of Africa in terms of capturing the elites. Thank you for that question. Yes, well, I, I think that the last uh, Pan-Africanist Congress was held in 1994, I think, in Africa. Um, I think it was held in, uh, uh, astride a um, African Union meeting. Then it, it wasn't called the African Union at the time, but, you know, the predecessor to the African Union. Um, that's, I, that, if my memory serves me correctly. I think that um, uh, the question about uh, um, you, you sort of African, there was, when you, I don't know if you've read the, uh, some of the obituaries of the late president Kenneth Kaunda of Zambia, and he just died about a week ago. It was very interesting because he was a great, uh, he was also very close, I think, to Gaddafi, and he was a leader in the Pan-Africanist Pan movement. I think what happened um, after 1960, after the wave of colonization, and I would say by 1965, 1970, except for Mozambique, Zimbabwe, and so on, much of Africa had been decolonized. Um, I think today there's been some disappointments with a decolonizing project. And most African countries have struggled to A, give effect to the promises of colonialism, of post-colonialism, um, and B, uh, I think that within Africa itself, um, there's, there, 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 there are great tensions. And so I, I mentioned South Africa, the xenophobia in South Africa, the Afrophobia, it's not xenophobia, because you know in South Africa, Polish and Hungarian people are not attacked but Zimbabwean and, and Somalis are. So that tells you that it's Afrophobia. Um, I think there's the, the refugee crisis. I think that a lot has happened that has sort of put paid to the idea of Pan-Africanism. You raised the question whether it's a, what was the word you used? A Western concept? Well, and why it was held abroad? Right. Yeah. yeah, I think that if you if you look at uh, the early days, if you also look at the anti-apartheid movement, um, centers like London and Paris, um, mostly European centers actually, and to some extent Australia and New Zealand, provided refuge for activists and you know, um, um, and even the United States did. 
uh, a refugee for those who were fighting colonialism. It was much harder to organize in colonial Kenya. You know, the British were brutal in Kenya. So it was easier actually, ironically, to organize in London and Manchester and so on. So I think those are the reasons why that you saw the, the meetings abroad. Um, and today, you know, you've also touched on a question. Here's a statistic. Uh, this was raised in one of the panels, I think, uh, yesterday. Um, the fact that there are so many African intellectuals who don't live on the continent. 90% of African academics do not live on the continent of Africa. They live in Canada and Australia and the United States and so on. That is a huge, huge dent in possibilities. And I know, I forget who the speaker was, who very clearly looked at what it means for the Africa Agenda 2063 when you have so many people who are not on the continent. So I know, I'm not sure if it's a Western, I think that we, we've been embroiled with the West um, in ways and the East. I mean, China is the biggest trading partner of most African countries now. And some people have argued that we've seen the second colonial movement because of China's um, uh, trade with Africa. Um, but I think that's just the nature of things. And in any event, I think now we live in such a globalized world and the um, diaspora is so connected to the, you know, the home country that it's hard to have that binary. So I hope that answered your question, Andrew. Hi, thanks. Yeah, it, it did. Well, I guess my point, I shouldn't, I said it like it was a tool of oppression of the US, but what I mean, is the sense that uh, some say that that Pan-Africanism was attacked by the U.S. Uh, when it attacked Libya, a and this idea that um, and so I, yeah, I, I agree. I, I didn't phrase it correctly. Yeah, well, you know, it's very interesting. You know, uh, Libya is a is a interesting point because the the history of decolonization in Africa is a a history of contradictions. I mean, Gaddafi did lots for liberation movements, but he also was a oppressor and a tyrant at home. You know, while Mobutu Sese Seko was condemning apartheid, and while the world was condemning apartheid, Mobutu Sese Seko was killing his own people. You know, there's, it's, a contra it's a story of contradictions. And I think that we have to grasp all of these. The many truths that we have to juggle and so Gaddafi is a, a, you know, the Americans, but they realize, you know, there were lots of geopolitical reasons for doing, uh, for what happened to Gaddafi. But he was, he's, he's not just a, a, a villain. He was also on, on some levels a savior. Um, but, you know, as, as with most leaders, a bundle of contradictions. Okay. Um, thank you. So I think we, we have, quite a number of questions in the group chat. So I'll just read a couple of them right now. So Veronica says that she's particularly interested in the extension of the American perspective of BLM. And she's asking if you, if you can please elaborate on how Africa can centralize some of, some of our own issues. Uh, is there any particular example with respect to the Agenda 63? And uh, yeah, so that's her question. Uh, so let me just go, it was uh, the, uh, I, I didn't get get the um, the uh, BLM. Sorry, can you just repeat that? Uh, okay, she wants you to please elaborate on how Africa can centralize some of um, its own issues. Yes, I've seen I've seen the chat here. Sorry to interrupt, Alapo, but I okay. see the question right here. Okay, okay. Uh, centralize our own issue. Um, so I think that this is one of the questions that I wanted to raise about BLM. Uh, BLM has injected a lot of energy into particularly police violence and the criminal justice system. And I was struck how um, South Africans uh, identified with BLM. They should. Police violence in South Africa is a serious problem. Um, you know, but police violence in South Africa is about the culture of police. It's not a racial thing. It's majority black police. The victims are majority black too. Um, in the United States, there's still a, a racial uh, discussion. So I do think that what we have to do is look at the issues. I think the question of police violence is important to deal with. 
uh, within the particular context, with their own, own context. Um, the question you've, I mean, uh, Veronica, it's a large question that you've raised. I mean, um, Agenda 2063 is the Marshall Plan for Africa. And it's, it's huge, it has so many parts. And um, yes, I think the important part is, is that we have to think about how we centralize our issues in a global context very, very difficult. I don't have any, I don't have any answers, but I think that what for, for, from my perspective, that, you know, indigenous ways of being and doing have for too long been discounted. And I think, for example, this was also raised in one of the sessions, this idea, and it's mentioned in 20, uh, the agenda 2063, the idea of Ubuntu, of a certain kind of way in which African culture and so on. And this is not to, it's not in any way being sentimental. It's just, it's a different communitarian approach to things, which is not how it's really approached in, in Western society. So I think those are the certain things that I think we can centralize. We just have to be determined to sort of hold on to principles that reflect our own history, our own traditions, our own cultures, uh, and so on. How we do it in a globalized world is a very, very different, a very difficult question. Uh, Veronica, I hope that was um, uh, satisfactory. I'm just looking at some more questions here. Uh, yeah, so we have another question from the Institute for African uh, Women in Law. Yes. And we thank you for, your, uh, for the historical connectivities you highlighted and have a question about how much of these historic events can we make central to Agenda 2063 in order to guide our futures across Africa? Oh, yes. Okay. Um, I, I think that there's something about the global pan-Africanist movement, the kind of energy of people from around the world focusing on a particular goal. Can people from around the world coalesce around Agenda 2063. So for example, I've been trying to think about BLM and trying to think about who in the movement represents the W.E. Du Bois's, Malcolm X. You know, these are Martin Luther King. Uh, um, for, a, for, a, for, a, for, a, for a moment in the United States and for it's, uh, those were long moments, there clearly were the connections between the people of Africa and, and people of the global South and, and, and African-Americans. I know, I'm not sure if I'm looking in the right places, but I'm not seeing that. Um, BLM is very strong and it resonates, but I don't see the kind of connections, the kind of reaching out to an idea of a pan-Africanism or decolonization and so on. That's really about a shared vision. Maybe somebody else has seen it, but I, I, I don't see it. I see very much a focus on American institutions and the unfinished business of the end of slavery and reconstruction and so on. I don't see a lot of analysis around Agenda 2063 and the kinds of issues that I think uh, many African uh, countries and the African Union is grappling with. But as I said, I don't see it. I've looked at the research, but I could, you know, when you think about Adam Getachew's book, he's, it's a very interesting book. And Achille Mbembe also raises this. So I see that, but whether I, I see figures in BLM that represent, you know, those other, the, 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 the movements that I just mentioned, um, they're not as visible. I hope that answered your question, Professor Japa. Okay, um, so I think George Izuaku has a related question, uh, but she first thanks thank you for uh, this beautiful history of Pan-Africanism. And she, she says that it's obvious that the founders had great hopes to Africans and people of African descent. Do you think Agenda 2063 will carry forward the ideals of the earliest Pan-Africanists? Um, I think, you know, that question is sort of similar to the one that was asked before. Uh, the ideals of Pan-Africanism, I think, is largely confined to the African continent, if the ideals are still there. Um, 
I think it's an ideal that's been stretched and and um, highly tested. Um, I, I'm not, even at the United Nations, I mean, South Africa held a seat on the Security Council about two years ago. It, I think it stepped down last year. Um, and I'm not sure, um, uh, sort of, uh, I haven't really kept up with the General Assembly around questions of Pan-Africanism, but I've not seen a movement both formally and informally. Um, what I have seen is a push for decolonization, mostly outside of the formal institutions of global governance. I know that the World Bank is now, I saw that the World Bank has just advertised for and filling a, a place for an anti, it's an anti-racist or a racial justice director. So I think the World Bank is starting to look at these questions, but I'm not sure if it's one about decolonizing or, and so on, but you know, it's certainly been triggered by Black Lives Matter. Thank you. Um, I think Professor Goldberg also has a question for you. Thank you. Thank you, Talapo, and thank you, uh, Professor Andrews, for an amazing talk. Um, so, I, so I wanted to ask about um, uh, about the the these the possibilities and uh, the the possibilities for um, a new uh, anti-colonial movement and. Um, and I guess for me in particular, um, you know, whether there's a way to decolonize um, the kinds of norms that um, that have built up globally, um, right? And and um, right. So one of the things that you mentioned, right, are uh, you know building an approach that can value the kinds of um, reciprocal obligations, right? The kinds of values that are that are present uh, in the continent. And one of the things that I worry about is the way that the um, the way that a lot of the um, mechanisms of control have become more diffuse. So in the colonial period, right, you had states who were colonizing other states, right, going in, uh, taking resources, right, et cetera, et cetera. We all know that situation, right? Now we have corporations who are, you know, the functional equivalents of, of these of these states, right? Um, so we have, um, right? We have the the we have you know multinational corporations. We have the the let's say the WTO regime that has you know excluded anything from trade, right? We have um, justice sector reform, rule of law, industry in uh, in Africa. That's almost like um, you know the uh, uh, current instantiation of the colonial imposition of external law, right? So we have all of these sort of diffuse um, ways that there's still resource extraction, there's still um, you know, uh, imposition of external law and social control. And so I, I, I just, how, you know, how, do we, um, how do we sort of generate the kinds of things that you're talking about to get into these more sort of diffuse places that um, where the, you know, the regulation and control has shifted from the more sort of overt state control to these more sort of diffuse mechanisms of, of social control. Um, how, do we, how do we sort of bridge that, that barrier, that obstacle? Yes, thank you. You know, the question that you raised about the fact that private corporations now act like governments and that, you know, we see it's an imperialism of a different kind. It's a problem, not just for the global South, it's a problem for the global North. I mean, you know, the United States is currently facing, who would have thought that in the United States, you know, we would have people who identify as socialists running for office and the mayor of Buffalo has just been elected and she identifies as a socialist. Who would have thought that we would talk about the right to healthcare, et cetera, because corporations have become, it's not only about what government can provide, but corporations have become governments themselves and can determine the way that a country's resources are going to be uh, um, are going to be sp uh, spent uh, 
difficult, difficult questions. Um, one thing that I think that the post, uh, the anti-colonial scholars had, and I think is relevant today, is the writings of Franz Fanon, Steve Biko, and so on about cultural imperialism, about how we, even without the economic trappings, we have so identified and, and, and associate with the global north. So, for example, when I'm in when I'm in Johannesburg or Cape Town in a mall, I could be in Chicago or New York. Young people are listening more to Beyonce than they're listening to local, you know, it's the same in Nairobi, I'm sure in other places. We have turn, internalized what we regard as um, important cultural traits. Now, of course, it's made easier by, you know, social media and the internet has allowed culture to, to you know, run ragged and it's, it's, I would say that American culture has usurped many other cultures with the acquiescence of people. So I, and then also part of us usurping that are yeah, certain values, both good and bad. So I think the problem starts with psychological and cultural colonization, which is what Franz von, as I said, Franz von Non spoke about it, Steve Biko, the, it, it, those are important things. It's very, very difficult. I think that, um, you know, capitalism, rampant capitalism as we know it, the kind of rapacious capitalism, it's very, very hard to challenge today uh, than it may have been in earlier times. And um, politics, identity politics have become the you know, sort of progressive politics in many places, but identity politics have limitations, deep limitations and serves, you know, that's why Nike can, you know, Black Lives Matter has been brand, it's a brand now in Nike and all of these places. Same with me too. Um, it's much, much harder to think creatively about a truly egalitarian world where the kinds of things that I think we all, anybody who's committed to social justice wants to see people live dignified lives, however we determine it. And that becomes more elusive. But I, I'm hopeful. I think that the pandemic has unleashed a huge amount of flaws and fissures in the world. And I don't think that it's possible to go back to, you know, uh, um, uh, what people thought. It, 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 things are definitely changing and it's changing in, in different places and there are signs of it uh, in many ways, in many places. And um, that may be that may be ultimately um, how we, we think about change. So Toby, Toby, that was a long way of responding to your question. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, I think Andrew has one more question. Andrew, do you want to ask a question now? Hi, thanks. Yeah, I uh, I asked permission from Delapo if I could ask one more, and, and so uh, I, I I just love. And she that gave you permission. That's so nice of her. Yeah, I want to leave space. If there's other people, feel free to just keep tossing your questions in the chat. But mm -hmm. I really loved how you talk, touched on the idea of Black Lives Matter being sort of a corporate symbol now. It, it, like in, indeed, it's not really something that I like like uh, promote that much in, in that form. Uh, while I do promote sort of racial justice and and, um, and treating people fairly and equally and without prejudice, but what I've found it, my whole life here in the West, uh, growing up, is that the tendency is to take the elite classes from the world and to bring them here, and then focus instead on identity politics instead of class politics. And there remains an uh, underprivileged class within these countries that are that are underserved and not represented in government or in the multinational, um, multinational organization. So I really loved how you, you pointed that point out that uh, identity politics is used as like a wedge to distract from issues of class. And I know this is true because even myself, as an undergraduate student, I was very poor and I was very, I remember asked my political science teacher, when's the revolution gonna happen? And he said, 
what revolution? I'm like, certainly there must be a revolution. The United States is just dominating the world. We're, we're so oppressed. But now that I have a, a job sort of in the future in the horizon and a faculty position and decent wage and benefits, then you start looking at, oh, the tax rate. Like you don't want to be paying too much taxes, right? So it's, it's easy that to, to focus instead on the identity policy when really this idea of redistribution is kind of lost because we've sort of once you look after yourself and, and we like we tend to look after ourselves you know primarily uh, in the west here it seems but uh, yeah if you could just talk about on that uh, issue of class a a as well yeah well uh, andrew sort of thank you for your candor i mean the thing is is that when you say people look after themselves you can spend any time in you know in uh, uh any city in South Africa, in Brazil, in India, people who have and who are the privileged by depriving the poor of dignified lives are not looking after themselves. They're putting up great security. Everybody needs a bodyguard and security and so on. So even the idea that you, it's not, they're not looking after themselves. They're protecting themselves against, you know, the masses. Um, I think that, you know, if you think about, I've always sort of thought that the, the Nordic countries got things right, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, but those countries are fairly homogeneous racially. Um, similarly, you know, places like Taiwan, you know, Singapore, South Korea, fairly homogeneous. How does that, how do you equate difference, particularly racial and ethnic difference? I don't have the answer. But I do believe that, you know, if you think about a society like Norway, where it's taken for granted, of course, people will pay taxes and lots of taxes because the state provides education, healthcare, the things that people need to live a dignified life. So it's also a cultural thing. I mean, I'm constantly shocked at you living in New York. There's a whole industry of people who try not to pay taxes or to pay, pay as little taxes as possible. So how do you think the, I always tell people, how do you think the roads are going to be maintained? How do you think, you know, the, so I think that it starts, it's a cultural thing. It's, it's uh, a political and a social thing. It's steeped in people's history, but it is, you know, I've always said if, if poor whites and poor blacks in the United States or poor people of color and poor whites got together, it would be an organized, there would be some serious reckoning happening but racial politics divides people. Uh, people identify far more with, you know, ethnic or racial groups than uh, those who are similarly situated economically. And um, it's a flaw of capitalism. And I don't think it's sustainable. I mean, we see places where there's such divides like South Africa and so on. Why does the, why is there such an outpouring? Why do um, uh, um, sort of middle-class people immigrate? to Australia and Canada from many, many parts of the global South. It's just not sustainable. They wanna leave. Um, but the global, now, the global North is facing some problems now. New York never thought that it would see the number of deaths that it did during the pandemic. They used to seeing, you know, Ebola and people. This was a, a shock. I think as well when people when people lost jobs and you saw the level of deprivation, that there's a serious conversation happening. So uh, Andrew, I agree with you. I'm, I'm not in any way wanting to trivialize just how hard and deep this is. This hard and deep because all of us want to be comfortable. All of us want to, you know, how can we sort of create the conditions where everybody can be comfortable, you know, so that we really do look out look after each other. Okay. Um, and did you have a further question? I just said, thank, thanks so much. Yeah, I guess if, if, if that's sort of how we think of Pan-Africanism and a way of how can we all look after each other, uh, expand the circle of care. And, and that, that's, I think, a good foundation moving forward. Thank you. Um, does, does anyone else have any other questions to ask um, before we wrap up? I wonder if, uh, if I could ask Leora, she just put out something on the chat. The EU Parliament resolution, what is it about Leora? Yeah, so it's an odd name, um, but it was something I came across in my own work looking at uh, colonialism and the right to truth. And this resolution is very unknown 
but it is a kind of it's called it's it's called the fundamental rights of people of African descent, but it's also it's about Afrophobia and colonialism, and it includes some commitments from the European Union to reckoning with colonialism. Ah. Ah. Um, um, so I mean, by all means, just click open the link and have a read because it's I mean, you know, the, it's, this is not a promotion of this instrument, but uh, but I was picking up on on something you were saying around the um, the World Bank or the IMF around these kinds of smaller steps coming towards that. So and I found this a rather interesting read in this context um, of a kind of cultural inability to grasp the sort of fundamental frame, you know, engagement with colonialism in, in Europe. Um, but I think that's interesting. I've never heard of it. No, no one but has. It seems like a very... I, found uh, it, I was like, oh, this is interesting, and no one's heard of it. <laughs> so, yeah. so the rights of people I, I of African it, descent. It yeah. It's a you know. Um, so. Yeah. Okay, do we have, I think we still have time for more more questions. Does anyone else want to contribute or ask a question? Okay, since we have no more questions, um, I think, yeah, I'd just like to thank Professor Andrews again for this very insightful talk. Again, since there's been a lot of interest um, about this topic. And I, I think it's a discussion we should continually have in different quarters and um, I'm hopeful that discussions we've had throughout this conference will be useful in, um, you know, pushing the envelope on, on achieving the goals and aspirations set out in Agenda 2063. And I also want to thank the speakers uh, so far the conference once again. Um, thank you for thank you all for participating. And just a reminder to all that we can also submit papers for publication um, in a, you know in a focused journal relating uh, really to the theme of the conference. Uh, you can send your papers. To agenda 2063 projects at alad.ubc.ca. I'll put the information about that in the group chat. So feel free to reach out if you have any questions, like to make connections, or um, you would like to submit a paper. So on that note, um, if Professor Goldberg and Sarah don't have any other contributions, uh, then I would declare the conference closed for this year. And I hope to see everybody else at future conferences that we're going to hold. Um, well, thank you. This was really wonderful. I think we should all unmute ourselves and clap for you, Sarah and Toby. You did a great job. Thank you, thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you.